Book Nine, Chapter One of Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Death Comes for the Archbishop, Chapter One. When that devout nun, Mother Superior Philomena, died at a great age in her native realm, among her papers were found several letters from Archbishop Latour, one dated December eighteen eighty eight, only a few months before his death since your brother was called to his reward he wrote i feel nearer to him than before for many years duty separated us but death has brought us together the time is not far distant when i shall join him meanwhile i am enjoying to the full that period of reflection which is the happiest conclusion to a life of action this period of reflection the archbishop spent on his little country estate some four miles north of santa fe long before his retirement from the cares of the diocese father latour bought those few acres in the red sand hills near the tesuque pueblo and set out an orchard which would be bearing when the time came for him to rest he chose this place in the red hills spotted with juniper against the advice of his friends because he believed it to be admirably suited for the growing of fruit once when he was riding out to visit the tesuke mission he had followed a stream and come upon this spot where he found a little mexican house and a garden shaded by an apricot tree of such great size as he had never seen before it had two trunks each of them thicker than a man's body and though evidently very old it was full of fruit the apricots were large beautifully colored and of superb flavor since this tree grew against the hillside the archbishop concluded that the exposure there must be excellent for fruit he surmised that the heat of the sun reflected from the rocky hill slope up into the tree gave the fruit an even temperature warmth from two sides such as brings the wall peaches to perfection in france the old mexican who lived there said the tree must be two hundred years old it had been just like this when his grandfather was a boy and had always borne luscious apricots like these the old man would be glad to sell the place and move into santa fe the bishop found and he bought it a few weeks later in the spring he set out his orchard and a few rows of acacia trees some years afterward he built a little adobe house with a chapel high up on the hillside overlooking the orchard thither he used to go for rest and at seasons of special devotion after his retirement he went there to live though he always kept his study unchanged in the house of the new archbishop in his retirement father latour's principal work was the training of the new missionary priests who arrived from france his successor the second archbishop was also an auvergnat from father latour's own college and the clergy of northern new mexico remained predominantly french when a company of new priests arrived they never came singly archbishop s sent them out to stay with father latour for a few months to receive instruction in spanish in the topography of the diocese in the character and traditions of the different pueblos father latour's recreation was his garden he grew such fruit as was hardly to be found even in the old orchards of california cherries and apricots apples and quinces and the peerless pears of france even the most delicate varieties he urged the new priests to plant fruit trees wherever they went and to encourage the mexicans to add fruit to their starchy diet wherever there was a french priest there should be a garden of fruit trees and vegetables and flowers he often quoted to his students that passage from their fellow auvergne pascal that man was lost and saved in a garden he domesticated and developed the native wild flowers he had one hillside solidly clad with that low-growing purple verbena which mats over the hills of new mexico 
it was like a great violet velvet mantle thrown down in the sun all the shades that the dyers and weavers of italy and france strove for through centuries the violet that is full of rose color and is yet not lavender the blue that becomes almost pink and then retreats again into sea-dark purple the true episcopal color and countless variations of it in the year eighteen eighty five there came to new mexico a young seminarian bernard ducrot who became like a son to father latour the story of the old archbishop's life often told in the cloisters and classrooms at montferrand had taken hold of this boy's imagination and he had long waited an opportunity to come bernard was handsome in person and of unusual mentality had in himself the fineness to reverence all that was fine in his venerable superior he anticipated father latour's every wish shared his reflections cherished his reminiscences surely the bishop used to say to the priests god himself has sent me this young man to help me through the last years end of book nine chapter one book nine chapter two of death comes for the archbishop by willa cather this librivox recording is in the public domain book nine chapter two throughout the autumn of the year eighty eight the bishop was in good health he had five french priests in his house and he still rode abroad with them to visit the nearer missions on christmas eve he performed the midnight mass in the cathedral at santa fe in january he drove with bernard to santa cruz to see the resident priest who was ill while they were on their way home the weather suddenly changed and a violent rainstorm overtook them they were in an open buggy and were drenched to the skin before they could reach any mexican house for shelter after arriving home father latour went at once to bed during the night he slept badly and felt feverish he called none of his household but arose at the usual hour before dawn and went into the chapel for his devotions while he was at prayer he was seized with a chill he made his way to the kitchen and his old cook fructosa alarmed at once put him to bed and gave him brandy this chill left him feverish and he developed a distressing cough after keeping quietly to his bed for a few days the bishop called young bernard to him one morning and said bernard will you ride into santa fe to-day and see the archbishop for me ask him whether it will be quite convenient if i return to occupy my study in his house for a short time je voudrais mourir à santa fe i will go at once father but you should not be discouraged one does not die of a cold the old man smiled i shall not die of a cold my son i shall die of having lived from that moment on he spoke only french to those about him and this sudden relaxing of his rule alarmed his household more than anything else about his condition when a priest had received bad news from home or was ill father latour would converse with him in his own language but at other times he required that all conversation in his house should be in spanish or english bernard returned that afternoon to say that the archbishop would be delighted if father latour would remain the rest of the winter with him magdalena had already begun to air his study and put it in order and she would be in special attendance upon him during his visit the archbishop would send his new carriage to fetch him as father latour had only an open buggy not to-day mon fils said the bishop we will choose a day when i am feeling stronger a fair day when we can go in my own buggy and you can drive me i wish to go late in the afternoon toward sunset bernard understood he knew that once long ago at that hour of the day a young bishop had ridden along the albuquerque road and seen santa fe for the first time 
and often when they were driving into town together the bishop had paused with bernard on that hilltop from which father vaillant had looked back on santa fe when he went away to colorado to begin the work that had taken the rest of his life and made him too a bishop in the end the old town was better to look at in those days father latour used to tell bernard with a sigh in the old days it had an individuality a style of its own a tawny adobe town with a few green trees set in a half circle of carnelian colored hills that and no more but the year eighteen eighty had begun a period of incongruous american building now half the plaza square was still adobe and half was flimsy wooden buildings with double porches scroll work and jack straw posts and banisters painted white father latour said the wooden houses which had so distressed him in ohio had followed him all this was quite wrong for the cathedral he had been so many years in building the cathedral that had taken father vaillant's place in his life after that remarkable man went away father latour made his last entry into santa fe at the end of a brilliant february afternoon bernard stopped the horses at the foot of the long street to await the sunset wrapped in his indian blankets the old archbishop sat for a long while looking at the open golden face of his cathedral how exactly young molny his french architect had done what he wanted nothing sensational simply honest building and good stone cutting good midi romanesque of the plainest and even now in winter when the acacia trees before the door were bare how it was of the south that church and how it sounded the note of the south no one but Molny and the bishop had ever seemed to enjoy the beautiful sight of that building. Perhaps no one ever would. But these two had spent many an hour admiring it. The steep carnelian hills drew up so close behind the church that the individual pine trees thinly wooding their slopes were clearly visible. From the end of the street, where the bishop's buggy stood, the tawny church seemed to start directly out of those rose-colored hills with a purpose so strong that it was like action seen from this distance the cathedral lay against the pine-splashed slopes as against a curtain when bernard drove slowly nearer the backbone of the hills sank gradually and the towers rose clear into the blue air while the body of the church still lay against the mountain the young architect used to tell the bishop that only in italy or in the opera did churches leap out of mountains and black pines like that more than once molny had called the bishop from his study to look at the unfinished building when a storm was coming up then the sky above the mountain grew black and the carnelian rocks became an intense lavender all their pine trees strokes of dark purple the hills drew nearer the whole background approached like a dark threat setting molny used to tell father latour is accident either a building is part of a place or it is not once that kinship is there time will only make it stronger the bishop was recalling this saying of molny's when a voice out of the present sounded in his ear it was bernard a fine sunset father see how red the mountains are growing sangre de cristo yes sangre de cristo but no matter how scarlet the sunset those red hills never became vermilion but a more and more intense rose carnelian not the color of living blood the bishop had often reflected but the color of the dried blood of saints and martyrs preserved in old churches in rome which liquefies upon occasion end of book nine chapter two book nine chapter three of death comes for the archbishop by willa cather this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three 
the next morning father latour wakened with a grateful sense of nearness to his cathedral which would also be his tomb he felt safe under its shadow like a boat come back to harbor lying under its own sea-wall he was in his old study the sisters had sent a little iron bed from the school for him and their finest linen and blankets he felt a great content at being here where he had come as a young man and where he had done his work the room was little changed the same rugs and skins on the earth floor the same desk with his candlesticks the same thick wavy white walls that muted sound that shut out the world and gave repose to the spirit as the darkness faded into the gray of a winter morning he listened for the church bells and for another sound that always amused him here the whistle of a locomotive yes he had come with the buffalo and he had lived to see railway trains running into santa fe he had accomplished an historic period all his relatives at home and his friends in new mexico had expected that the old archbishop would spend his closing years in france probably in carmont where he could occupy a chair in his old college that seemed the natural thing to do and he had given it grave consideration he had half expected to make some such arrangement the last time he was in auvergne just before his retirement from his duties as archbishop but in the old world he found himself homesick for the new it was a feeling he could not explain a feeling that old age did not weigh so heavily upon a man in new mexico as in the puy de dome he loved the towering peaks of his native mountains the comeliness of the villages the cleanness of the countryside the beautiful lines and the cloisters of his own college claremont was beautiful but he found himself sad there his heart lay like a stone in his breast there was too much past perhaps when the summer wind stirred the lilacs in the old gardens and shook down the blooms of the horse chestnuts he sometimes closed his eyes and thought of the high song the wind was singing in the straight striped pine trees up in the navajo forests during the day his nostalgia wore off and by dinner time it was quite gone he enjoyed his dinner and his wine and the company of cultivated men and usually retired in good spirits it was in the early morning that he felt the ache in his breast it had something to do with waking in the early morning it seemed to him that the gray dawn lasted so long here the country was a long while in coming to life the gardens and the fields were damp heavy mists hung in the valley and obscured the mountains hours went by before the sun could disperse those vapors and warm and purify the villages in new mexico he always awoke a young man not until he rose and began to shave did he realize that he was growing older his first consciousness was a sense of the light dry wind blowing in through the windows with the fragrance of hot sun and sagebrush and sweet clover a wind that made one's body feel light and one's heart cry to-day to-day like a child's beautiful surroundings the society of learned men the charm of noble women the graces of art could not make up to him for the loss of those light-hearted mornings of the desert for the wind that made one a boy again he had noticed that this peculiar quality in the air of new countries vanished after they were tamed by man and made to bear harvests parts of texas and kansas that he had first known as open range had since been made into rich farming districts and the air had quite lost that lightness that dry aromatic odor the moisture of ploughed land the heaviness of labor and growth and grain bearing utterly destroyed it one could breathe that only on the bright edges of the world on the great grass plains or the sagebrush desert that air would disappear from the whole earth in time perhaps but long after his day 
he did not know just when it had become so necessary to him but he had come back to die in exile for the sake of it something soft and wild and free something that whispered to the ear on the pillow lightened the heart softly softly picked the lock slid the bolts and released the prisoned spirit of man into the wind into the blue and gold into the morning into the morning end of chapter three book nine chapter four of death comes for the archbishop by willa cather this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter four father latour arranged an order for his last days if routine was necessary to him in health it was even more so in sickness early in the morning bernard came with hot water shaved him and helped him to bathe they had brought nothing in from the country with them but clothing and linen and the silver toilet articles that olivares had given the bishop so long ago these thirty years he had washed his hands in that hammered basin morning prayers over magdalena came with his breakfast and he sat in his easy chair while she made his bed and arranged his room then he was ready to see visitors the archbishop came in for a few moments when he was at home the mother superior the american doctor bernard read aloud to him the rest of the morning saint augustine or the letters of madame de sevigny or his favorite pascal sometimes in the morning hours he dictated to his young disciple certain facts about the old missions in the diocese facts which he had come upon by chance and feared would be forgotten he wished he could do this systematically but he had not the strength those truths and fancies relating to a bygone time would probably be lost the old legends and customs and superstitions were already dying out he wished now that long ago he had had the leisure to write them down that he could have arrested their flight by throwing about them the light and elastic mesh of the french tongue he had indeed for years directed the thoughts of the young priests whom he instructed to the fortitude and devotion of those first missionaries the spanish friars declaring that his own life when he first came to new mexico was one of ease and comfort compared with theirs if he had used to be abroad for weeks together on short rations sleeping in the open unable to keep his body clean at least he had the sense of being in a friendly world where by every man's fireside a welcome awaited him but the spanish fathers who came up to zuni then went north to the navajos west to the hopis east to all the pueblos scattered between albuquerque and taos they came into a hostile country carrying little provisionment but their breviary and crucifix when their mules were stolen by indians as often happened they proceeded on foot without a change of raiment without food or water a european could scarcely imagine such hardships the old countries were worn to the shape of human life made into an investiture a sort of second body for man there the wild herbs and the wild fruits and the forest fungi were edible the streams were sweet water the trees afforded shade and shelter but in the alkali deserts the water-holes were poisonous and the vegetation offered nothing to a starving man everything was dry prickly sharp spanish bayonet juniper greasewood cactus the lizard the rattlesnake and man made cruel by a cruel life those early missionaries threw themselves naked upon the hard heart of a country that was calculated to try the endurance of giants they thirsted in its deserts starved among its rocks climbed up and down its terrible canyons on stone bruised feet broke long fasts by unclean and repugnant food surely these endured hunger thirst cold nakedness 
of a kind beyond any conception st paul and his brethren could have had whatever the early christians suffered it all happened in that safe little mediterranean world amid the old manners the old landmarks if they endured martyrdom they died among their brethren their relics were piously preserved their names lived in the mouths of holy men writing with his alvernats to the old missions that had been scenes of martyrdom the bishop used to remind them that no man could know what triumphs of faith had happened there where one white man met torture and death alone among so many infidels or what visions and revelations god may have granted to soften that brutal end when as a young man father latour first went down into old mexico to claim his see at the hands of the bishop of durango he had met on his journey priests from the missions of sonora and lower california who related many stories of the blessed experiences of the early franciscan missionaries their way through the wilderness had blossomed with little miracles it seemed at one time when the renowned father junipero serra and his two companions were in danger of their lives from trying to cross a river at a treacherous point a mysterious stranger appeared out of the rocks on the opposite shore and calling to them in spanish told them to follow him to a point farther up the stream where they forded in safety when they begged to know his name he evaded them and disappeared at another time they were traversing a great plain and were famished for water and almost spent a young horseman overtook them and gave them three ripe pomegranates then galloped away this fruit not only quenched their thirst but revived and strengthened them as much as the most nourishing food could have done and they completed their journey like fresh men one night in his travels through durango father latour was entertained at a great country estate where the resident chaplain happened to be a priest from one of the western missions and he told a story of this same father junipero which had come down in his own monastery from the old times father junipero he said with a single companion had once arrived at his monastery on foot without provisions the brothers had welcomed the two in astonishment believing it impossible that men could have crossed so great a stretch of desert in this naked fashion the superior questioned them as to whence they had come and said the mission should not have allowed them to set off without a guide and without food he marvelled how they could have got through alive but father junipero replied that they had fared very well and had been most agreeably entertained by a poor mexican family on the way at this a muleteer who was bringing in wood for the brothers began to laugh and said there was no house for twelve leagues nor any one at all living in the sandy waste through which they had come and the brothers confirmed him in this then father junipero and his companion related fully their adventure they had set out with bread and water for one day but on the second day they had been travelling since dawn across a cactus desert and had begun to lose heart when near sunset they espied in the distance three great cottonwood trees very tall in the declining light toward these they hastened as they approached the trees which were large and green and were shedding cotton freely they observed an ass tied to a dead trunk which stuck up out of the sand looking about for the owner of the ass they came upon a little mexican house with an oven by the door and strings of red peppers hanging on the wall when they called aloud a venerable mexican clad in sheepskins came out and greeted them kindly asking them to stay the night going in with him they observed that all was neat and comely and the wife a young woman of beautiful countenance was stirring porridge by the fire her child scarcely more than an infant and with no garment but his little shirt was on the floor beside her playing with a pet lamb they found these people gentle pious and well spoken the husband said they were shepherds the priest sat at their table and shared their supper and afterward read the evening prayers 
they had wished to question the host about the country and about his mode of life and where he found pasture for his flock but they were overcome by a great and sweet weariness and taking each a sheepskin provided him they lay down upon the floor and sank into deep sleep when they awoke in the morning they found all as before and food set upon the table but the family were absent even to the pet lamb having gone the fathers supposed to care for their flock when the brothers at the monastery heard this account they were amazed declaring that there were indeed three cottonwood trees growing together in the desert a well-known landmark but that if a settler had come he must have come very lately so father junipero and father andrea his companion with some of the brothers and the scoffing muleteer went back into the wilderness to prove the matter the three tall trees they found shedding their cotton and the dead trunk to which the ass had been tied but the ass was not there nor any house nor the oven by the door then the two fathers sank down upon their knees in that blessed spot and kissed the earth for they perceived what family it was that had entertained them there father junipero confessed to the brothers how from the moment he entered the house he had been strangely drawn to the child and desired to take him in his arms but that he kept near his mother when the priest was reading the evening prayers the child sat upon the floor against his mother's knee with the lamb in his lap and the father found it hard to keep his eyes upon his breviary after prayers when he bade his hosts good night he did indeed stoop over the little boy in blessing and the child had lifted his hand and with his tiny finger made the cross upon father junipero's forehead this story of father junipero's holy family made a strong impression upon the bishop when it was told him by the fireside of that great hacienda where he was a guest for the night he had such an affection for that story indeed that he had allowed himself to repeat it on but two occasions once to the nuns of mother philomena's convent in riome and once at a dinner given by cardinal mazuki in rome there is always something charming in the idea of greatness returning to simplicity the queen making hay among the country girls but how much more endearing was the belief that they after so many centuries of history and glory should return to play their first parts in the persons of a humble mexican family the lowliest of the lowly the poorest of the poor in a wilderness at the end of the world where the angels could scarcely find them end of chapter four book nine chapter five of death comes for the archbishop by willa cather this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five after his dejeuner the old archbishop made a pretense of sleeping he requested not to be disturbed until dinner-time and those long hours of solitude were precious to him his bed was at the dark end of the room where the shadows were restful to his eyes on fair days the other end was full of sunlight on grey days the light of the fire flickered along the wavy white walls lying so still that the bedclothes over his body scarcely moved with his hands resting delicately on the sheet beside him or upon his breast the bishop was living over his life when he was otherwise motionless the thumb of his right hand would sometimes gently touch a ring on his forefinger an amethyst with an inscription cut upon it auspice maria father vaillant's signet ring and then he was almost certainly thinking of joseph of their life together here in this room in ohio beside the great lakes as young men in paris as boys at montferran there were many passages in their missionary life that he loved to recall and how often and how fondly he recalled the beginning of it they were both young men in their twenties curates to older priests when there came to clermont a bishop from ohio a native of auvergne looking for volunteers for his missions in the west 
father jean and father joseph heard him lecture at the seminary and talked with him in private before he left for the north they had pledged themselves to meet him in paris at a given date to spend some weeks of preparation at the college for foreign missions in the rue de bac and then to sail with him from cherbourg both the young priests knew that their families would strongly oppose their purpose so they resolved to reveal it to no one to make no adieu but to steal away disguised in civilian's clothes they comforted each other by recalling that St. Francis Saviour, when he set forth as missionary to India, had stolen away like this, had passed the dwelling of his parents without saluting them, as they had learned at school. Terrible words to a French boy. Father Vaillant's position was especially painful. His father was a stern, silent man, long a widower, who loved his children with a jealous passion and had no life but in their lives joseph was the eldest child the period between his resolve and its execution was a period of anguish for him as the date set for their departure drew near he grew thinner and paler than ever by agreement the two friends were to meet at dawn in a certain field outside riam on the fateful day and there await the diligence for paris jean latour having made his decision and pledged himself knew no wavering on the appointed morning he stole out of his sister's house and took his way through the sleeping town to that mountain field tip tilted by reason of its steepness just beginning to show a cold green in the heavy light of a cloudy daybreak there he found his comrade in a miserable plight joseph had been abroad in the fields all night wandering up and down finding his purpose and losing it his face was swollen with weeping he shook with a chill his voice was beyond his control what shall i do jean help me he cried i cannot break my father's heart and i, I cannot break the vow i have made to heaven i had rather die than do either ah if i could but die of this misery here now how clearly the old archbishop could recall the scene those two young men in the fields in the gray morning disguised as if they were criminals escaping by stealth from their homes he had not known how to comfort his friend it seemed to him that joseph was suffering more than flesh could bear that he was actually being torn in two by conflicting desires while they were pacing up and down arm in arm they heard a hollow sound the diligence rumbling down the mountain gorge joseph stood still and buried his face in his hands the postilion's horn sounded allons said jean lightly la vitation du voyage you will accompany me to paris once we are there if your father is not reconciled we will get bishop f to absolve you from your promise and you can return to riom it is very simple he ran to the roadside and waved to the driver the coach stopped in a moment they were off and before long joseph had fallen asleep in his seat from sheer exhaustion but he always said that if jean latour had not supported him in that hour of torment he would have been a parish priest in the puy des dames for the rest of his life of the two young priests who set forth from riom that morning in early spring jean latour had seemed the one so much more likely to succeed in a missionary's life he indeed had a sound mind in a sound body during the weeks they spent at the college of foreign missions in the rue du bac the authorities had been very doubtful of joseph's fitness for the hardships of the mission field yet in the long test of years it was that frail body that had endured more and accomplished more father latour often said that his diocese changed little except in boundaries the mexicans were always mexicans the indians were always indians 
Santa Fe was a quiet backwater with no natural wealth, no importance commercially. But Father Vaillant had been plunged into the midst of a great industrial expansion, where guile and trickery and honorable ambition all struggled together, a territory that developed by leaps and bounds and then experienced ruinous reverses. Every year, even after he was crippled, he traveled thousands of miles by stage and in his carriage among the mountain towns that were now rich, now poor, and deserted. Boulder, Gold Hill, Caribou, Casa La Pudra, Spanish Bar, South Park, up the Arkansas to Cash Creek, and California Gulch. And Father Vaillant had not been content to be a mere missionary priest. He became a promoter. He saw a great future for the church in Colorado. While he was still so poor that he could not have a rectory of ordinary comfort to live in, he began buying up great tracts of land for the church. He was able to buy a great deal of land for very little money, but that little had to be borrowed from banks at a ruinous rate of interest. He borrowed money to build schools and convents, and the interest on his debts ate him up. He made long begging trips through Ohio and Pennsylvania and Canada to raise money to pay this interest, which grew like a rolling snowball. He formed a land company, went abroad and floated bonds in France to raise money, and dishonest brokers brought reproach upon his name. When he was nearly seventy, with one leg four inches shorter than the other, Father Vaillant, then first bishop of Colorado, was summoned to Rome to explain his complicated finance before the papal court, and he had very hard work to satisfy the cardinals. When a dispatch was flashed into Santa Fe, announcing Bishop Vaillant's death, Father Latour at once took the new railroad for Denver, but he could scarcely believe the telegram. He recalled the old nickname, Trompe la Mort, and remembered how many times before he had hurried across mountains and deserts, not daring to hope he would find his friend alive. Curiously, Father Latour could never feel that he had actually been present at Father Joseph's funeral. Or rather, he could not believe that Father Joseph was there. The shriveled little old man in the coffin, scarcely larger than a monkey, that had nothing to do with Father Vaillant. He could see Joseph as clearly as he could see Bernard, but always as he was when they first came to New Mexico. It was not sentiment. That was the picture of Father Joseph his memory produced for him, and it did not produce any other. The funeral itself he liked to remember as a recognition. It was held under canvas in the open air. There was not a building in Denver, in the whole far west, for that matter, big enough for his Blanchet's funeral. For two days before, the populations of villages and mining camps had been streaming down the mountains. They slept in wagons and tents and barns, they made a throng like a national convention in the convent square, and a strange thing happened at that funeral. Father Revardy, the French priest who had gone from Santa Fe to Colorado with Father Vaillant more than twenty years before, and had been with him ever since as his curate and vicar, had been sent to France on business for his bishop. While there he was told by his physician that he had a fatal malady, and he at once took ship and hurried homeward to make his report to Bishop Vaillant and to die in the harness. When he got as far as Chicago, he had an acute seizure and was taken to a Catholic hospital, where he lay very ill. One morning a nurse happened to leave a newspaper near his bed. Glancing at it, Father Revardy saw an announcement of the death of the Bishop of Colorado. When the sister returned, she found her patient dressed. He convinced her that he must be driven to the railway station at once. On reaching Denver, he entered a carriage and asked to be taken to the bishop's funeral. He arrived there when the services were nearly half over, and no one ever forgot the sight of this dying man, 
supported by the cab driver and two priests making his way through the crowd and dropping upon his knees beside the bier a chair was brought for him and for the rest of the ceremony he sat with his forehead resting against the edge of the coffin when bishop vaillant was carried away to his tomb father rivardi was taken to the hospital where he died a few days later it was one more instance of the extraordinary personal devotion that father joseph had so often aroused and retained so long in red men and yellow men and white End of chapter five Book nine, chapter six of Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. During those last weeks of the bishop's life, he thought very little about death. It was the past he was leaving. The future would take care of itself. But he had an intellectual curiosity about dying, about the changes that took place in a man's beliefs and scale of values more and more life seemed to him an experience of the ego in no sense the ego itself this conviction he believed was something apart from his religious life it was an enlightenment that came to him as a man a human creature and he noticed that he judged conduct differently now his own and that of others the mistakes of his life seemed unimportant accidents that had occurred en route like the shipwreck in galveston harbor or the runaway in which he was hurt when he was first on his way to new mexico in search of his bishopric he observed also that there was no longer any perspective in his memories he remembered his winters with his cousins on the mediterranean when he was a little boy his student days in the holy city as clearly as he remembered the arrival of m molny and the building of his cathedral he was soon to have done with calendared time, and it had already ceased to count for him. He sat in the middle of his own consciousness. None of his former states of mind were lost or outgrown. They were all within reach of his hand, and all comprehensible. Sometimes, when Magdalena or Bernard came in and asked him a question, it took him several seconds to bring himself back to the present, he could see they thought his mind was failing, but it was only extraordinarily active in some other part of the great picture of his life, some part of which they knew nothing. When the occasion warranted, he could return to the present, but there was not much present left. Father Joseph dead, the Olivares both dead, Kit Carson dead. Only the minor characters of his life remained in present time. One morning, several weeks after the bishop came back to Santa Fe, one of the strong people of the old deep days of life did appear, not in memory but in the flesh, in the shallow light of the present, El Sabio the Navajo. Out on the Colorado Chiquito he had heard the word, passed on from one trading post to another, that the old archbishop was failing, and the Indian came to Santa Fe. He, too, was an old man now. Once again their fine hands clasped. The bishop brushed a drop of moisture from his eye. I have wished for this meeting, my friend. I had thought of asking you to come, but it is a long way. The old Navajo smiled. Not long now, any more. I come on the cars, Padre. I get on the cars at Gallop, and the same day I am here. You remember when we came together once to Santa Fe from my country, how long it take us? Two weeks, pretty near. Men travel faster now, but I do not know if they go to better things. We must not try to know the future, El Sabio. It is better not. And Manuelito? Manuelito is well. He still leads his people. El Sabio did not stay long, but he said he would come again tomorrow, as he had business in Santa Fe that would keep him for some days. He had no business there, but when he looked at Father Latour, he said to himself, It will not be long. After he was gone, the bishop turned to Bernard. My son, 
i have lived to see two great wrongs righted i have seen the end of black slavery and i have seen the navajos restored to their own country for many years father latour used to wonder if there would ever be an end to the indian wars while there was one navajo or apache left alive too many traders and manufacturers made a rich profit out of that warfare a political machine and immense capital were employed to keep it going chapter seven the bishop's middle years in new mexico had been clouded by the persecution of the navajos and their expulsion from their own country through his friendship with il sabio he had become interested in the navajos soon after he first came to his new diocese and he admired them they stirred his imagination though this nomad people were much slower to adopt white man's ways than the home-staying indians who dwelt in pueblos and were much more indifferent to missionaries and the white man's religion father latour felt a superior strength in them there was purpose and conviction behind their inscrutable reserve something active and quick something with an edge the expulsion of the navajos from their country which had been theirs no man knew how long had seemed to him an injustice that cried to heaven never could he forget that terrible winter when they were being hunted down and driven by thousands from their own reservation to the bosque redondo three hundred miles away on the pecos river hundreds of them men women and children perished from hunger and cold on the way their sheep and horses died from exhaustion crossing the mountains none ever went willingly they were driven by starvation and the bayonet captured in isolated bands and brutally deported it was his own misguided friend kit carson who finally subdued the last unconquered remnant of that people who followed them into the depths of the canyon de chez whither they had fled from their grazing plains and pine forests to make their last stand they were shepherds with no property but their livestock encumbered by their women and children poorly armed and with scanty ammunition but this canyon had always before proved impenetrable to white troops the navajos believed it could not be taken they believed that their old gods dwelt in the fastnesses of that canyon like their ship rock it was an inviolate place the very heart and centre of their life carson followed them down into the hidden world between those towering walls of red sandstone spoiled their stores destroyed their deep sheltered cornfields cut down the terraced peach orchards so dear to them when they saw all that was sacred to them laid waste the navajos lost heart they did not surrender they simply ceased to fight and were taken carson was a soldier under orders and he did a soldier's brutal work but the bravest of the navajo chiefs he did not capture even after the crushing defeat of his people in the canyon de chez manuelito was still at large it was then that el sabio came to santa fe to ask bishop latour to meet manuelito at zuni as a priest the bishop knew that it was indiscreet to consent to a meeting with this outlawed chief but he was a man too and a lover of justice the request came to him in such a way that he could not refuse it he went with el sabio though the government was offering a heavy reward for his person living or dead manuelito rode off his own reservation down into zuni in broad daylight attended by some dozen followers all on wretched half-starved horses he had been hiding out in el sabio's country on the colorado chiquito it was manuelito's hope that the bishop would go to washington and plead his people's cause before they were utterly destroyed they asked nothing of the government he told father latour but their religion and their own land where they had lived from immemorial times their country 
he explained, was a part of their religion. The two were inseparable. The canyon de Chez, the Padre knew. In that canyon, his people had lived when they were a small, weak tribe. It had nourished and protected them. It was their mother. Moreover, their gods dwelt there, in those inaccessible white houses set in caverns up in the face of the cliffs, which were older than white man's world, and which no living man had ever entered. Their gods were there, just as the Padre's god was in his church. And north of the Canyon de Chez was the ship rock, a slender crag rising to a dizzy height, all alone out on a flat desert. Seen at a distance of fifty miles or so, that crag presented the figure of a one-masted fishing boat under full sail, and the white man named it accordingly. But the Indian has another name. He believes that rock was once a ship of the air. Ages ago, Manuelito told the bishop, that crag had moved through the air, bearing upon its summit the parents of the Navajo race from the place in the far north where all peoples were made, and wherever it sank to earth was to be their land. It sank in a desert country, where it was hard for men to live. But they had found the canyon de Chez, where there was shelter and unfailing water. That canyon and the ship rock were like kind parents to his people, places more sacred to them than churches, more sacred than any place is to the white man. How then could they go three hundred miles away and live in a strange land? Moreover, the Bosque Redondo was down on the Pecos, far east of the Rio Grande. Manolito drew a map in the sand and explained to the bishop how, from the very beginning, it had been enjoined that his people must never cross the Rio Grande on the east, or the Rio San Juan in the north, or the Rio Colorado in the west. If they did, the tribe would perish. If a great priest like Father Latour were to go to Washington and explain these things, perhaps the government would listen. Father Latour tried to tell the Indian that in a Protestant country the one thing a Roman priest could not do was to interfere in matters of government. Manuelito listened respectfully, but the bishop saw that he did not believe him. When he had finished, the Navajo rose and said, you are the friend of cristobal who hunts my people and drives them over the mountains to the bosque redondo tell your friend that he will never take me alive he can come and kill me when he pleases two years ago i could not count my flocks now i have thirty sheep and a few starving horses my children are eating roots and i do not care for my life but my mother and my gods are in the west, and I will never cross the Rio Grande. He never did cross it. He lived in hiding until the return of his exiled people. For an unforeseen thing happened. The Bosque Redondo proved an utterly unsuitable country for the Navajos. It could have been farmed by irrigation, but they were nomad shepherds, not farmers. There was no pasture for their flocks. There was no firewood. They dug mesquite roots and dried them for fuel. It was an alkaline country, and hundreds of Indians died from bad water. At last, the government at Washington admitted its mistake, which governments seldom do. After five years of exile, the remnant of the Navajo people were permitted to go back to their sacred places. In 1875, the bishop took his French architect on a pack trip into Arizona to show him something of the country before he returned to France, and he had the pleasure of seeing the Navajo horsemen riding free over their great plains again. The two Frenchmen went as far as the Canyon de Chez to behold the strange cliff ruins. Once more crops were growing down at the bottom of the world between the towering sandstone walls sheep were grazing under the magnificent cottonwoods and drinking at the streams of sweet water it was like an indian garden of eden now when he was an old man and ill scenes from those bygone times dark and bright flashed back to the bishop 
the terrible faces of the Navajos waiting at the place on the Rio Grande where they were being ferried across into exile, the long streams of survivors going back to their own country, driving their scanty flocks, carrying their old men and their children, memories, too, of that time he had spent with El Sabio on the little Colorado in the early spring, when the lambing season was not yet over, dark horsemen riding across the sands with orphan lambs in their arms, a young Navajo woman giving a lamb her breast until a ewe was found for it. Bernard, the old bishop would murmur, God has been very good to let me live to see a happy issue to those old wrongs. I do not believe, as I once did, that the Indian will perish. I believe that God will preserve him. Chapter 8 The American doctor was consulting with Archbishop S. and the Mother Superior. It is his heart that is the trouble now. I have been giving him small doses to stimulate it, but they no longer have any effect. I scarcely dare increase them. It might be fatal at once, but that is why you see such a change in him. The change was that the old man did not want food, and that he slept, or seemed to sleep, nearly all the time. On the last day of his life his condition was pretty generally known— the cathedral was full of people all day long praying for him, nuns and old women, young men and girls, coming and going. The sick man had received the viaticum early in the morning. Some of the Tesuque Indians who had been his country neighbors came into Santa Fe and sat all day in the archbishop's courtyard, listening for news of him. With them was El Sabio the Navajo, Fructosa and Tranquilino, his old servants, were with the supplicants in the cathedral. The mother superior and Magdalena and Bernard attended the sick man. There was little to do but to watch and pray, so peaceful and painless was his repose. Sometimes it was sleep, they knew from his relaxed features. Then his face would assume personality, consciousness, even though his eyes did not open. Toward the close of day, in the short twilight after the candles were lighted, the old bishop seemed to become restless, moved a little, and began to murmur. It was in the French tongue, but Bernard, though he caught some words, could make nothing of them. He knelt beside the bed. "'What is it, father? I am here.' He continued to murmur, to move his hands a little, and Magdalena thought he was trying to ask for something— or to tell them something. But in reality the bishop was not there at all. He was standing in the tip-tilted green field among his native mountains, and he was trying to give consolation to a young man who was being torn in two before his eyes by the desire to go and the necessity to stay. He was trying to forge a new will in that devout and exhausted priest, and the time was short for the diligence for Paris was already rumbling down the mountain gorge. When the cathedral bell tolled just after dark, the Mexican population of Santa Fe fell upon their knees, and all American Catholics as well. Many others who did not kneel prayed in their hearts. El Sabio and the Tesuque boys went quietly away to tell their people, and the next morning the old archbishop lay before the high altar in the church he had built. End of chapter 8 End of Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather Read by Carol Pelster